Our Father in heaven, in Numbers 23, 16, your word says, And the Lord met Balaam and put a word in his mouth. Father, your word speaks very negatively about Balaam. Jude verse 11, Warn to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the way of Balaam for reward. Very negatively. Father, if you can put a word in Balaam's mouth, and he was going to curse your people, put the word in my mouth, because I have not come to curse them, but to deliver the truth as it is in Jesus. So put your word in my mouth, I pray, for your own glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 16. The Gospel of Luke, reading from verse 16. Do we have Luke 4? Reading from verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I am directing your attention to what Jesus said in verse 18. And 19, as he lists the purposes why he came. The overall purpose, of course, was to glorify his Father and to make the atonement for sin. But he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to do what? Heal the brokenhearted. Then the third statement he makes, to preach deliverance to whom? The captives. What's the next statement? To do what? Recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, uh, please think with me. To set at liberty them that are bruised. The very presence of the word liberty gives us some indication of what being bruised might mean. Someone bruised, needing to be set at liberty, something about being bruised must suggest oppression or some form of imprisonment. He came to preach deliverance to the captives. Who are these captives? And deliverance from what? When Jesus spoke these words, as we're told in verse 17, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place. Let us now find that place. Isaiah 61, reading from verse 1. Isaiah 61, let us see how Isaiah actually wrote it. There's a little difference in wording, but the meaning is the same. Let us see the exact wording that Isaiah uses. Isaiah 61, reading verse 1. This is the passage from which Jesus Christ is quoting. Do we have that reference? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to do what? Preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim what? Liberty to whom? And how, what's the final statement of that verse? Opening of what? The prison to whom? Them that are bound. Now, Isaiah says that one of the missions of the Savior would be to open the prison of them that are bound. Isaiah says to preach deliverance. Uh, Luke says to preach deliverance to the captives Isaiah says, proclaim liberty 
to the captives. Same thing. What is this deliverance? And who are the captives? And who has them captive? And I want you to listen very carefully. Not to me, to the word of God. But to me merely as God's servant. It's a mark of respect to God. Proclaiming liberty to the captives. Preaching deliverance to the captives. Setting at liberty them that are bruised. In connection with this is also recovering of sight to the blind. It has to do with proclaiming liberty to the captives, and we shall see that. Let us go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. There's a glare on the clock. Could someone lend me a watch? 7.30. Thank you, my dear brother. This says... 7.33, so I'll go by your time. <laughs> All right. Isaiah 14, reading from verse 12. Are we at the place? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will do what? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to where? To hell, to the sides of the pit. Verse 16 says what? They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? You know, one day we'll see Satan. And we'll say these exact words. Is this Satan who caused all that? Is this the man that made what? The earth to tremble that did shake what? Kingdoms. Is this the man that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? Now finish verse 17. Come on, finish it. And now finish verse 17. Finish it. That opened not the house of his prisoners. It is essential that you and I understand there are some things Satan will not do unless he is forced. And the force that forces him must exceed his power. What's our theme? Looking unto Jesus. that opened not the house of his prisoners. When Satan gets you, and it's possible he has some of us, Satan refuses to let you go. Only when he is forced and there is only one power under heaven that can force Satan to let us go. And that power is Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. So when Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the power that Jesus exercises, as we discovered a couple of days ago, is exercised through his agent who is the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus said, that spirit is upon me because he hath anointed me in my humanity. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Now someone here tonight is a captive. Now it may be smoking. Spousal abuse theft of the tithe. Whatever it is that has you or has me bound. And nights pass and nights come and nights go and we kneel and we cry. Because somewhere in our hearts we don't want to continue this way but it's almost as if there is a power irresistible that propels us and compels us to behave this way. We are bound. 
maybe there's someone here who fits that unflattering description. Jesus said, I came to set you free. And this is no joke. Too many of us think uh, religion or Christianity is a joke. Or Seventh-day Adventism is a joke. It's not a joke. There is a battle for my life. There is a battle for your life. And that battle is intense and it's bloody. And so the Bible says, He opened not the house of his prisoners. And if he doesn't open it, and Christ said, I came to set you free, then someone has to open that house. Now, the captives, who could the captives possibly be? Let's look at the possibilities. It could be the angels in heaven, the angels who were thrown out, inhabitants of unfallen worlds, or the inhabitants of this world. Now, we know it's not the angels in heaven. The fallen angels, well, they are in another prison. 2 Peter 2 verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved, that is imprisonment. Now that's God's prison. Are you following me? The fallen angels are in God's prison. It is a circumstantial prison, but a prison nonetheless. Reserved, unto, there is nothing they can do to escape that condition of being reserved unto judgment. So we have chains. As one day as an angel will bind Satan with chains, Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3. So those fallen angels, they are God's prisoners, not Satan's prisoners. The inhabitants of unfallen worlds, well, Satan is now reserved only to this world. He can't ply his business over there anymore. Our prophet informs us. So they're unfallen, no sin. Where there's no sin, there is no captivity to Satan. Do you understand that? You, you understand that. Where there is no sin, there's no captivity. Well, the third group left, or the other group left, is those who inhabit this fallen world. Sin in our lives gives Satan the right to occupy us. Now, when Adam fell, based on the principle of 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. When Adam fell, the world turned over to Satan's dominion. Christ won that back legally at Calvary. I say legally because Christ himself called him the prince of this world. And after Christ went back, Paul calls him the God of this world. So legally, but Christ has not yet occupied it. That day is coming. Can you say amen? amen. And let us all make preparations to be with Christ when he occupies that which presently is legally his based on Calvary. Not only this world, but all the universe affected by sin. But for now, to some degree, Satan has his way. When I travel, I'm going to Indonesia in October. I was in Kenya a week and a half ago. I usually go to the embassy of the United States and register my presence in that country. Let them know where I am, something happens. Hopefully someone can help. <laughs> now, when I step onto the grounds of that embassy, where am I? <laughs> In the United States. Legally. Do you understand that? That is U.S. soil. And the police of that country cannot pursue me into the embassy. They have to wait outside. That's why people seek asylum in embassies. Some people remain in embassies for years because they can't be shipped out, they can't come out, but they can't be pursued in there. But in that embassy, that is the soil of the country. 
In a similar way, if you go to, let's say, the Malaysian Embassy in D.C. or New York, wherever it is, when you enter the ground, you are on Malaysian soil. Sin is Satan's embassy. And Jesus respects that. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of legality to sin and righteousness. Are you listening to me? This is, this is, it's, it's, it's a legal battle. You have the law involved. It's legal. Satan has a right to the soul where sin is a permanent resident. Because that sin constitutes a satanic embassy. And Satan has a right to occupy that life. And Jesus has no legal right to go crashing in unless there's a cry for help. You see, when you give your life to Christ, you say, Lord, I confess my sins, I, give my, I accept you as my Savior, then you become Christ's. And Christ comes to get what is his. Are you following me? Persistent sin. I didn't say a mistake constitutes an embassy. I didn't say that. The smallest sin persistently cherished will take you to hell as much as you name who is presumably the worst sin you can think of. Now, in Matthew 12, let's go there. Matthew 12. And I don't have a title for this presentation. You think of one and use it. <laughs> Matthew 12, reading from verse 22. It's uh, quarter to eight. Matthew 12, reading from verse 22. We have Matthew 12. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and what? And he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Interesting the word healed. Deliverance from demon possession is a healing. Not just an exorcism. It is a healing. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. He heals, and the Greek word is therapeuo. We know therapy, therapeutic. He healed him in so much that his condition was reversed. Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. That was his condition, and he healed him in so much. What does in so much suggest to you? To the extent... God saves us, how? Unto the uttermost. And some preachers have this cute way of saying from the guttermost to the uttermost. In so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. His condition was reversed. Remember the thief on the cross? According to Matthew 27, 44, the thieves also which were with him cast the same in his teeth when he was being abused and humiliated by the passers-by, the elders, chief priests, scribes. The thieves, plural, did the same thing. But in Luke 23, where we have the, the very familiar story of Jesus saving that man, the Bible says, one of them said, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. Luke 23, 39. But the other answering rebuked him. Now we have a rebuke. What he was doing in Matthew 27, 44, he does the opposite in Luke 23, verse 40. Why? Because he has been touched by Christ in so much that he goes from being an attacker of Christ to what? A defender of Christ. That's how Christ heals in so much. man who used to beat his wife now willingly dies for her. Now the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, verse 25, Matthew 12, and said unto them, 
a king, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to what? Desolation. And every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. What Christ is saying, look, you Pharisees, you have disciples, those whom you teach, and they presumably cast out demons too. Well, if I cast them out by Beelzebub, by whom do they cast them out? The same accusation you make against me, you must make against your disciples. The word children there is the Greek word weos, meaning sons, followers of. So Christ has them in a corner now, argumentatively. They're in a corner. Can't see anything. Then verse 20, Jesus says, But if I cast out devils, how? By the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Now listen to verse 29. Or else, how can one do what? Enter into whom? A strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. The word spoil doesn't mean to get rotten. It means to take away. Now, in the context of the, the, the healing that Jesus did for that man, verses 22, 22, by delivering him from demon possession. You know, in Acts, Acts 10, 30, the Bible says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The word there, oppressed, means to exercise dominion over. What am I saying? There are people oppressed by Satan. They are in his prison house. And Satan does everything possible to do what? Keep you in that house. Keep you in that cell. Keep you smoking. Keep you selfish. Keep me proud. Whatever it is. But Jesus says, there is a stronger man who has the power to bind that strong man. Tie him up. The Bible says in Acts 9, reading from verse 1, Then Paul, or Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to, the, to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, meaning the Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them Bound, same word, bind that strong man. He might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And when God told Ananias, he's sending Saul, Ananias said, what? In verse 14 of Acts 9, he said, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias understood Paul used to bind them. Handcuffs. Jesus says, I can do the same thing to Satan. I can bind him. In order to let you go. Or else how can one enter into strong man's house. And spoil his goods. You see. The man Christ delivered. Was the goods of Satan. Are you listening to me? Here comes Christ. Here's that man bound. He had a demon. Verse 22 of Luke, uh, Matthew 12. Blind and dumb. Blind would have been bad enough or dumb. He's blind and dumb. That's extreme satanic imprisonment. But there's no degree of possession that Christ cannot break. He said he came to do that. That is why it is an insult to the power of Christ to say, that's the way I am, I can't change. And too many Christians take comfort in saying, that's the way I am. That's exactly why Christ came. Because that's the way you are, and that's the way I am. And when Jesus came to that man, blind and dumb, Christ delivered him. You know my word, in, as, in, as much, in so much that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. In Matthew 8, verse 16, the Bible says, And when the even was come, they brought unto him all that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the devils. They were possessed with demons. He cast out the devils how? By his word. Matthew 8, 16. 
He cast out the devils. How? By his word. Now, I don't know what form of imprisonment you're experiencing, if any at all. But I want to tell you tonight that the power to be delivered is in your hands. Amen. I have nothing against therapists, but Jesus is a therapist. Amen. You know, sometimes I, <laughs> there's, there's some words I hate. I have come to hate because of their associations and their, like the word celebrate. I hate it. Because, you know, the popular culture says celebrate this and celebrate that. Celebrate your lesbianism. Celebrate your homosexuality. Celebrate your bad health. Celebrate everything. So I have developed an animosity towards the word celebrate. And a similar relationship with the word embrace. Embrace your this. Embrace your that. Embrace. Gets me sick. (laughs) So I just hate those words. But let me tell you something. Whatever your imprisonment is, therapist, fine. Psychologist, fine. If you're in in the room, blessings upon you. But the thing I was about to say is that one of the words I hate is closure. God knows I despise that word, closure. Everybody wants closure. And closure can take 25 years. He hurt me and I need closure. My wife treated me badly, I need closure. (laughs) Now this is not funny. You listen to Oprah Winfrey and don't spend much time doing that. What are you, what everyone is, come on and tell Oprah, national TV, that your mother spanked you and get closure. (laughs) And then you wonder, what happened to forgiveness? Hmm? When Christ was on the cross, when he was on the cross, I'm getting back to therapists in a minute. What did he say? Father, what? How, How much closure did he need? Now, that's the greatest offense ever committed against sin against God. If anyone needed closure, it's God. When Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7, what were his dying words? Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. That was closure. You see, if, <laughs> listen to me. Forgiveness is more powerful than we understand. Let me get back to the therapy. Whatever your imprisonment is or mine, start with Christ. Amen. Now, yes, you can talk to your buddies. Or you may talk to the pastor. Yes, yeah, fine. Or you may talk to a Christian psychologist if you want. The foundation of your healing is this. Because the Holy Ghost works through this. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are what? They are spirit. That's the Holy Spirit working through the word. That's why Christ could use the word to cast out demons. Because this word is the same word that said, let there be light, and there was light. And Satan has to bow to the authority of this word. And so when he came in a quiet bluster in the wilderness and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And Satan backed up. And he changed temptations. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hand they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Jesus said again, It is written, Satan changed temptations. Jesus never changed his response. Because there's only one thing that works. Now you're bound. Christ will deliver you. Call him. Call him. Because you cannot deliver yourself. I heard someone say, who was it? Someone. Uh, this 
I, I, actually, I have a friend who used to drink. And he just stopped because he was sick and tired of drinking. <laughs> he just stopped, as we say, cold turkey. But what I've always wanted to tell him over the years, I'm not saying he takes pride in that, but in case he does, when that's the kind of victory you win, it only takes a severe calamity to send you back. Are you listening to me? A real traumatic event. But when your victory is based on Christ, it endures all the tests. Now, I don't want to see him go back and drink. Don't get me wrong. But in the back of my mind, I've been always desiring to tell him, look, you better credit that victory to God. Because a sufficiently severe event will send you back to drink. I think it was Dr. Preby who said this morning, it is better not to sin than to sin and be forgiven. Because forgiveness does not remove the scar. You ask Lot. The Bible describes Lot as a just man, a righteous man. Same as Abraham. There are two ways to be righteous. You're either righteous or you're not. He was just, 2 Peter 2, 6 through 8, righteous. But the catastrophic choice he made in Genesis 13 when he chose to live on the plains of Sodom. Then the next time we find him, he's in, the, he's in Sodom. He suffered the consequences for the rest of his life fathered his children's children. Not by his own consent, but had he not been in Sodom, he would not have been in that situation. He was forgiven, but he carried the scars for life. That thief on the cross, Jesus forgave him. He was heaven bound on the cross, but he was not taken off the cross. Jesus left him on the cross because we've got to pay for our sins at least at the secular level. You are a thief. I forgive your sin. You have admission to heaven through me. But you've got to pay your debt to society. Stay on that cross. You know, we all want God to forgive us and change all our circumstances. Father, you know, I've been illicit and uh, not illicit, uh, immoral and promiscuous and whatever else. And, you know, forgive me for my sins and take away the AIDS. The forgiveness is guaranteed. The healing of the AIDS is not. Because we need to understand prevention is better than cure. Now, this is a little digression. Jesus can heal you, but the surgical scars remain. And they affect us. They affect us. Because the memory of that sin stays with us. They affect us. Let me get back to being bound. Christ wants to deliver you and me. Sexual addiction, Christ can deliver you. But you must want it with all your heart, with all your soul. You can't stop reading stupid novels, harlequin romance. Christ can get it out of you. If that's what you want. You know, in Deuteronomy 5.29, one of my favorite verses, you can hear God crying. When he says, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me. It is as, and I think Brother Preby also said it. What God really wants is the heart. Is it in the heart to obey? Once you give God that heart, he knows out of that heart will proceed obedience because out everything comes out of the heart. You didn't get it. My mistake. My fault. Let me try it again. Everything starts in the heart. It doesn't start in your hand. You punch someone in the nose, your, your hand didn't sin. Are you with me? Your fist can't sin. The sin occurred right here. Even if you never actually landed, you missed, you still sin. Are you following me? You see, because it occurred here. And so God says, I want here to be fully committed to me, like Abraham. Hmm? When God said, sacrifice Isaac on one of the mountains, which I shall tell thee of, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, and clave the wood of the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And he began to act in faith to God's word. Then he showed God the heart he had. And then God said, lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Verse 11, Genesis 22. For now, what? 
I know. I like to say God is from Missouri. <laughs> Show me, yes. He is from Missouri. Show me. You want to be delivered? What's the next two words I want to hear you say? Show me. Show me how badly you want to stop smoking. You want to stop taking drugs? Show me by cutting off your friendships with those who do the same thing. Show me. Move to another city if necessary. Show me, says God. Now you're bound by Satan and the lock is on the outside. You can't get out. You want to get out? Yes. Show me. So when you and I go to church and we pray and we, we give tithe and, we, and we, we call it works, that's just our way of showing God. I'm so grateful for this salvation. Let me show you. And so show God that you want to be set free. Start praying. Make changes in your life. I was talking to a young lady. We finished a a revival crusade in Detroit area. And this young lady came to me. And she'd been a member of a church where I had the privilege of pastoring uh, up until 2001. And I knew she was struggling. I knew it. But I also could see beyond the struggle, she had a heart to serve God, but she was struggling. And so I left that church in 201. Now it's 208. Seven years later, she comes to this crusade. Working on the Sabbath, but wants to stop. It bothers her. Has three or four boyfriends. Wants to stop that. And she came to me and she said, she said, you know, I went through my phone book. Two young ladies told me that actually. She said, I cut off, I erased all the numbers of friends who were of no spiritual value to me. Now, what is she doing to God? She's showing God. You see, God won't come down and blot out the names. He won't come down and grab you by the hand and say, don't walk down the street. That's where the liquor stores are. You walk down this street. He won't do that. He won't take the cigarette from between your lips. And he won't pull you out of that man's house where, to whom you're not married. He's not doing that. You can do that by his help. Show me. You see, some people enjoy captivity. You know the Israelites, whenever things went wrong in the wilderness, what was their first desire? Go back to Egypt. And then they described how they would eat. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all beside this light bread before our eyes. They, they rehearse the good old days of slavery. Some people enjoy their captivity. Some of us have pet sins we carry around on a leash. They walk with us like little poodles and we. This is serious business. We don't want to be delivered. Lustful thoughts all the time. You can't just blame the girls in church who won't stop wearing tight pants. You just can't blame them all the time. They have some responsibility. They please don't walk out. They have some responsibility, yes. Because you are your brother's keeper. Now, this is where you start regretting asking me to speak, but I have to say it. <laughs> Some people will go to hell because of you. Did I just say something that's true? Amen. Yes. Listen to me. When God said to Cain, where is Abel thy brother? He was not asking for information from a GPS system. He wasn't asking for that. He was telling Cain, you ought to have some knowledge of the condition of your brother. Because you bear some responsibility for his state. We come to church every Sabbath and I'm digressing again. And people don't come and we don't even care. So God comes to us, where is that member? What member? You mean the lady with the three children, no husband? That, that one. Oh, Father, I was busy passing out tracts. You know, I'm Sabbath school superintendent, head deaconess, you know, uh, treasurer. I, I don't have time to see who's here and who's not. 
But God is still asking us, where's thy brother? Now, on Sabbath mornings, and God asks, he comes to sister, he says, sister, where is thy brother's thoughts when you walk past him? When I counsel people, I've never counseled a woman whose problem was lust. No, one, one, one. I correct that. One. And I hope I don't get a second. But for men, young men, one of the frequent problems is lust. And they tell me why. And the first reason they give is the way the ladies dress in the church. Now you can say that's his business, I can't control his thought. Uh-uh, it's your business too. It's your business too. If God, if it weren't your business, God would have made 8 billion adults and just populated the earth. He made two adults. Everyone else comes into this world influenced by circumstances and person's behaviors. That's God's plan. Development must take place in a cocoon of influence. The child sees the father, sees the mother, sees the relatives, sees the neighbors, observes, and grows up that way. But it is God's desire that he sees the right things. So there are some men in a prison of lust, and a contributing factor to that is the dress style of women in the church. And don't tell me I'm just on the side of men. No, I'm on the side of right. <laughs> Christ can break you out. Let me close the book because you... Oh, it's 10 after 8, sorry. There's deliverance tonight. Starting tonight. Amen. Identify in your mind that one thing where you know, and I know, we have a problem. Identify it in your mind. Don't tell me. Having done that, question number one, do you really want to get rid of it? That may sound like a pointless question. No, it's not pointless. Do you really want to get rid of it? I was talking to a lady somewhere in the world and I've learned to say somewhere in the world because these messages go <laughs> all over the place. And uh, she came to me. She was seeing a man who was not her husband. I said, why don't you stop? He supports my children. No, yeah, right, yeah, not her husband. She support, he supports my children. I said, sister, I don't care. Who he supports? Your life is in risk, at risk, and you're endangering his to some degree. You need to stop and trust God to support you and your children. But I can't see how uh, I, well, I didn't tell her I don't care, but I'm just telling you, I don't care. I just don't care. When it comes to eternal life, there are a lot of things you must say, I don't care. I'm not losing my eternal salvation. But she, she wanted to, but didn't want to, because she brought a reason why she needed to stay in that cell of infidelity or whatever it was. Maybe my prison is the thing I do, I enjoy, so I don't want to leave it at all. I like it. You know, Moses gave up the pleasures of what? Yes, for a season. Sin is pleasurable, some sins. And that's not to be denied. But when you're converted, you find no pleasure in sin. You find joy now in spiritual things. Your appetites have changed. But some of us, the, our, our imprisonment is so luxurious. You know, when big shots are convicted of crimes, they don't go to the same prisons like you and I go to. <laughs> don't say amen. <laughs> we, they go to different prisons where, like country clubs. Remember Martha Stewart? She didn't go to Sing Sing. Oh, what's the one in this area? Rikers Island, or that's on the east. Name one. Chino. Sister, how do you know that? Yeah, Chino. <laughs> No, that's not where she went. She went to a country club prison. Gourmet meals. And you can go home and check your email and come back. You know, that, sort of, that sort of rubbish. And that's where she went. Now, some of us are in prisons like that. 
And so we have ceased to see ourselves in prison. Now, let me go quickly to associate, I told you earlier, blindness is a form of imprisonment. Go quickly to Isaiah 46, and then we'll close. Isaiah 42, sorry, not 46. 42 verses 6 and 7, quickly. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. Let's associate blindness now with imprisonment. Do you have it? I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thy hand, and will keep thee, and will give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Look at verse 7. Read it with me if you have the King James Version. To do what? Open the blind eyes. To do what? Bring out the prisoners from where? And them that sit where? In darkness out of what? The prison house. Dark blindness is a form of imprisonment. That's why Jesus came to recovering of sight to the blind. And some people are blind to the fact they're imprisoned. And that's very, very tragic. And by his Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ tries to open the eyes. Let me, let me, and I, won't, I was about to make a confession, but maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, let me do it. I did not realize how deep pride was in me until I started to pray about it. Now, you may not have that experience, but this is mine. I started to pray. Sometimes I would cry. Lord, when I stand in a pulpit, let me seek only your glory. And the Lord showed me for all these years, even though people were baptized and lives were changed, I was to a large degree glorifying myself. And when he showed that to me, you know how embarrassing that was? Embarrassing. Because all this time I thought I was glorifying God. And then the Lord began to give me impulses right on the pulpit. Let me tell you another secret. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> this is, no, this is serious. You know how the Lord rebukes me when I glorify myself on the pulpit? You see how I preach? From here. That's by conviction. I have no other choice. You know how God punishes me in the pulpit? Can you take a guess? Forget. But God is so merciful, I apologize. You know, it happened tonight. But what, what happened, while I'm talking, I'm praying, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I apologize. You know what God does? He brings it right back. Amen. Listen to me, I want to glorify God. Can you say amen for God? I am really serious, and I learned the lesson in Australia. I'm talking about not knowing you're in prison. I was preaching in Australia. And I shut the Bible and put it on the pulpit and I started preaching from that. And my memory went blank. Just for a microsecond. Trying to recall a verse. And the Holy Spirit said to me, yes, I've given you that ability, but don't you ever shut that Bible again. Amen. Open it. Amen. And so people, why do you carry a Bible? I said, no, I, I, that's my business. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that's my business and listen to me every time I'm in a pulpit and I say something cute that God doesn't need my memory goes blank and immediately and I, I, I start to panic because what, what am I going to do and I say Lord I'm telling you the truth in the presence of a living God it happened tonight Father I'm sorry please bring it back and he brings it back and my prayer is, Lord, now that you've made me aware of this, I want to come to the place where you never have to blank my memory again. Amen. Now, I know the, the, the prison cell I was in. I'm sure there are others. Self-promotion in the pulpit. Our last text was Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. Look at verse 8. A good digression. Look at verse 8. Read it out loud. What does it say? I am the Lord. Go on. That is my name. Go on. My glory what? Will I not do what? Give to another. That's right. Now he'll give me his character. But not the awe and the, and the praise and the applause due his name. God said, I give that to no one. And so I was in that prison, I admit it. And I still wrestle every day. 
when I have to preach, I don't like people to talk to me. And I come across as unpleasant because of that. No, I'm not unple- I'm a nice fellow. <laughs> but I am rustling. I am praying. I am begging. When I stand up there, please, Father, since something's happened unconsciously, let me consciously and unconsciously direct the glory to you. Amen. You have identified the area of imprisonment. Do you want to get out? Call on Christ. Make up your mind. I want to break this thing. I don't care what it is. You're the CEO of Loma Linda Foods. You fired people. You know, you like to push your way around and walk all over people. God will get you out of that and give you the humility of Christ, who never had to say to anyone, do you know who I am? Now, if anyone had a qualification to say that, it was Christ. He was the creator. He never said, do you know who I am? He just took it. And the higher you go, the more humble you should be. Is that your imprisonment? You're just uh, obsessed with your career. No time for the church. You need to break out of that. Always arguing about the Bible. There's a text somewhere I can find. I have a quotation. Elway says, people are always arguing about the Bible a little. They need to be reconverted. If the Bible is always an intellectual discussion, it wears on you. The moment you jump out of the pulpit, someone has to tell you, well, look, you, know, you said Adam was 931 years old. He was 930. Okay. <laughs> so what? All, what is, my brothers and sisters, let's make a decision tonight. I have a form of imprisonment, and I want Christ to break me out through his word. Remember some text I gave you the other night. 1 John 3, 8, he that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might do what? Destroy him. That's right, binding the strong man. To destroy the works of the devil, you have to bind him first. Hebrews 2, 14. For as much as the children of God, the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might do what? Destroy him. Christ will do that. Luke 10, 19. Wherefore, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That power can work for you starting tonight. Make a decision. God cannot decide for you. He decided to send Christ, but he can't decide for you to believe. Make a decision, Lord. I want to be delivered from this. Find Bible texts associated with that imprisonment. And now use the nuclear power of the word of God to destroy it and to come out at, the invita- at, at Christ's beckon. Is anyone listening to me who has a form of imprisonment? Can I see your hand if you will admit that? Don't tell me what it is. You have a form of imprisonment. Okay, hands down. As the recording angel is preparing to write, who wants to break out of it? Stand up. It doesn't take God long to deliver us. The problem is our unwillingness. In John 14, 9, when Jesus answered Philip, Hast thou, have I been so long time with thee, and, not, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Just three and a half years, he was with him. That's all. And in that short time, Christ said, you ought to know me very well. Christ expects some things to happen quickly. You have stood publicly before heaven and earth as your witnesses and mine to say, Father, I want to break out of that thing I've identified in my mind. Find Bible verses connected with it. If your imprisonment is anger, Proverbs 16, 32. He that is slow to anger is stronger than the mighty. 
And he that ruleth his spirit, then he that taketh a city. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You find verses that deal with anger. If it is stealing, you just go to the commandment, thou shalt not steal. Whatever it is, you get a concordance. Go through the Bible, identify verses directly related. Because when the devil said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Jesus did not say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He said, it is written, thou man shall not live by bread alone. His verse suits and fit the temptation like a receptor site and um, what's that thing? Enzyme. That was God telling me I didn't need to say that. Find a text that matches. Are you following me? Amen. Not every Bible verse works for every situation. So David didn't say deliver me from theft. He said deliver me from blood guiltiness. Specific. Put those verses in your head. <clears throat> every day, seek deliverance from that every day. LOI says to follow Christ means wholehearted conversion at the start and a repetition of this conversion every day. This one, con one time conversion doesn't work. Every day, you say, Father, deliver me and keep me delivered every day. Keep me delivered. I've, I, pride is what you're delivering me from. Father, today I come to you seeking your humility. Today you find verses on humility. You find them, you read them, you make them your own. You put your name in the verse and you say it as a personal word of God to you, a word of power. God wants to deliver you. You're stingy, won't support the work of the church. You find verses. And give God all your heart. And see what he does in your life in a shorter period of time than you would have imagined. Amen. The freedom begins tonight. Because we've sent out the call. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, first of all, if I've preached badly, forgive me. Please, take this patchwork attempt of mine, Lord, fix it up. And then apply it to every heart, please. Father, I think of Galatians 5, 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Father, that's what we need, to stand in the freedom that the gospel brings. Please, God, please hear every honest heart crying for deliverance from that which has had them bound maybe for years. And as they cry out, Father, you come on in with all your forces. Bind that strong man. And set us free. Please do it, Father. We invite you to do it. We give you permission to do it any way you choose. We come into your hands as clay in the hands of the potter. Bind the enemy as you have on past occasions. And deliver us in so much that if we were blind and dumb, now we see and we speak. Father, as we leave this place, let this message not be taken away by the birds of secular thinking and talking. But let us reflect let us meditate that the message now through the process of meditation may sink down into our hearts and reach the roots of our motives. God, please hear this humble prayer. I offer it from my heart with a request for forgiveness of sins and thanksgiving for what you have begun to do. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. God bless you and please have a good night.